Welcome in, everyone, to a very special episode of American Joyride. I'm joined today by Bob Porras, call sign Ninja, a former Delta Force operator and CIA operative. This is going to be a very unique episode because we've got someone who's not just from the Tier 1 military world, but also from the CIA world, which, to my knowledge, we've never had before. So, Bob, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me, David. Good meeting you. I the honor is all mine. I I've watched a couple of podcasts you've done. I said I need to reach out. I saw your Sean Ryan episode. I thought it was absolutely incredible. So I reached out. You were kind enough to be here. And I always like to start with the guest background. How did you find yourself in the military? Oh, uh, I, I followed a similar path, I guess, as most people that join the military. The military, the military. Uh, Living in Southern California, Los Angeles, uh, specifically, um, no real direction in my life, really. So it's like, what, what next, right? Go to get into the graduate uh, high school, get into the corporate side of things, get it, get a good job, get into a management training program. Figured this just doesn't seem like this is going to be it, right? And so that's when I finally started checking out what's what's available. And I had no no plans to go to the military at the time. I heard about it. I know people who, who were in it. My older sister was in the Army at the time, and she loved it. And she said, sure, if you're going to do that, that's awesome. Um, so I, it was just a matter of, you know, I want to see what's next. And a little bit bigger than, because in L.A., when you grow up in L.A., that's all you know. I mean, there's really, you're, you're so in this bubble of Los Angeles, so many things going on. Um so I uh, went and talked to the recruiters. They're all in one place. They're all in this one shopping center, uh, strip mall kind of thing. And talked to all of them. Ended up in the Army because they had uh, a lot of good things to do. <laughs> Everything that I wanted to do. Plus, um, so my dad told me, you know, that's good if you do that. But make sure you get a job skill, right, when you're in the military. He didn't He didn't specify anyone. He's like, he didn't, he didn't say go to Marines because he's a Marine, right? He didn't say any of that. He said, just find out what you can get as far as a job skill when you get out. And the Army was the only one who was going to say, yes, we can make you an engineer. You qualified in your testing to be an engineer and we'll bring you in as an engineer. So that's how it, that's how it worked out. And I could translate that back. I you know, expected to do four years, get a job skill and then um, enter the workforce back in the Los Angeles area. And obviously, uh, you were in uh, longer than four years, didn't obviously go initially what you were according to plan. So what unit do you end up becoming a member of initially? So first unit I was in was the 76th Engineer Battalion at Fort Meade, Maryland. And so it's heavy construction equipment. So the engineer battalions have everything you can normally see at a construction site. So the, the Army and the military in general does airfields and roadways, right? And so all the heavy construction equipment to clear land, surveyors, um, all that stuff. I mean, from ground up uh, construction stuff. Um, and I was a heavy equipment operator. So big bulldozers and earth moving stuff. And uh, yeah, there was, what, what were we doing? It was like Maryland. So my first take, uh, my first time that I'm living like a winter that it snows, right? And living in snow. So as engineers, we're now snow removers for the, uh, for the base. So that was my first job. Um, pretty, pretty cool. Um, no real roads and airfields to be built at the time. So at the time there's really, so we're not at war anywhere. We're got a lot of, you know, if you're thinking about the 1980 timeframe, a lot of terrorist acts. And I only remember hearing that throughout the seventies, um, on the news, cause that's what was on the news every night. And then in the eighties, same thing. Um, a lot of uh, skyjackings were popular at the time. The Iranian rescue and all that stuff's going on at the, those during those times. And I, it's not—I wasn't even anything having had had anything to do with that stuff. Um, especially as an engineer, I was still in the four years in. I get this job skill and go back home. Um, but when I was talking to the, my recruiter initially, I just saw so many things in the office that intrigued me, <laughs> and. Um, Ended up, well, and so another thing my dad said was, whatever you do, get a job skill, right? And if don't leave uh, wanting to have done something, right? Because you always, you know, with no regrets, right? If you want to try something before you come home, that's, he said that for like the 20 years I was in, <laughs> each time I re-enlisted. 
um, just make sure you, you accomplish what you want to do and then um, satisfy your, your needs there in that regard. And then, you know, head back, head back home. And so 20 years later, <laughs> I just kept, you know, what's next, what's next, what's next. And um, yeah, went the whole infantry route, special forces adopted a unit. And I mean, it was just a chain of events that I, is, and I just, that was with the two things. I got a job skill, my dad put in my head, get a job skill and don't leave without, you know, something undone. It took me to 20 years. It, I mean, which is incredible. We're gonna unpack a lot of that 20 year timeline. When Panama kicks off, what are you doing at this point in the military? So I'm at a uh, seventh infantry division in Fort Ord, California. Um, I end up there as a consequence of my attempts to get to the Ranger Battalion in Savannah, Georgia. Um, doesn't go the way I want it to. The army thinks better of where they need me. And I end up at Fort Ord. And at the time I didn't know even that there was an army base at Fort Ord. Um, Bonnery, California. So uh, in that area, and I was from Southern California, so I had no clue that there was army base. It was all, from my knowledge, it was all Marine Corps and Navy bases. Um, but it, the, the army's doing this thing at the time. So 10th Mountain Group is being formed. 7th Infantry Division is being formed. Um, all the light infantry, so they're making this big transition, to these light infantry divisions. And 7th Infantry was one of them. So it's a reactivation. They were active and then deactivated. Um, and so I spent oh, a good six years there. Um, but so as I grew up, I changed my MOS from engineering to infantry. And that was my, that was where I started doing my infantry stuff other than, so I tried, I was at uh, seventh, um, uh, or, uh, range regiment for a year and a half, but I wasn't ever assigned. I was always attached. And that's when I was trying to transition. And that was the thing I was doing on my own. <laughs> I was, that's what I wanted to go. So I was out for betting, went and signed in a Ranger Regiment, stayed there for a good year and a half. But um, the Army, at the time, those two divisions that were standing up, the light infantry thing was a huge thing. And eventually I had to go to Fort Ord. Um, ended up to be great. I had So they had this new thing going on too. There's a, they called it a cohort uh, system. So the troops at the time were coming in and they stayed together through basic training, their advanced individual training. And then they go to this all at the same time to the same unit. So they all stay together through the whole process. So I go there with a bunch of other NCOs and officers to make the uh, staff, this new company and battalion that was being formed and stayed with that group. The first three, three years, that group uh, was my first group. The second group that I had, that's the group that I ended up taking, uh, we go on, uh, go to Panama with. So E6 kind of um, right at the, uh, right at the execution level of, you know, troops in combat. Um, I loved every minute of it, uh, but I was a squad leader had, uh, so uh, what they call like a tables of organization, right? There's a, there's only nine people in a squad and, so, and I was a squad leader, I had two team leaders, and then it goes down in, in the chain of command like that. And then you have the troops, right? So, and I had two machine gun teams attached to me in Panama, uh, additional folks attached to me in Panama, because uh, unbeknownst to us, we were going to be right at the at the the first stopping point for the Battalion 2000, which was Noriega's army, uh, to come back into Panama, retake Panama City. <laughs> And so uh, that's where we end up. Um, and it's like, okay, well, let's do it, man. This, this is the infantry. Well, this is what I really want to kind of dive into to start here, because I feel like people my age, I'm in my early 30s, certainly people 20s and then their teens. Many of them don't even know Panama happened. If you said what happened in Panama, they'd be like, you mean the canal that's down there? They don't have a clue <laughs> that the United States conducted military operations there. So yeah. when you so when you get to Panama, are you in the initial first wave of guys that go in? Yeah, so I'm I'm on Seventh Infantry Division is a light infantry uh, non airborne um, unit. So as this as everybody's staging in, so 82nd jumps in, who we're eventually going to go help in Panama City, and we divide up Panama City. It's 
uh, between the 7th Infantry and 82nd Airborne. So all those folks jump in. The Rangers jump in. That's the initial, uh, you know, infill. So December 20th, um, they're jumping in and they're on the ground. We're flying in and we're hoping that one of the places that uh, that the the main hub and uh, the air base down there, that's secured and then others can land so we can start spreading out and then expand operations, right? So that was part of that. Um, and we were delayed going in. Uh, we we took off from Travis Air Force Base and we're next stop was, you know, uh, whatever that air base name is in Panama City. I can't remember the name of the air base now. Um, but but we get diverted and we have to land at uh, in Texas. I can't remember the air base there. I was in San Antonio. And because we're being told that the airfield's being attacked and mortared and shelled and all that stuff. So uh, it's like, all right, well, we're, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to jump, I mean, literally land right in the middle of it, right, as it's going. And um, all right, you know, let's do it. Let's do this thing, right? The guys are, we know that guys are already on the ground. So we're, we're you know, eager to get in the fight too. And as the stages are going, they're on the ground. Uh, SEALs are doing their thing on the, on the coast. And, uh, you know, a lot of things are happening that night. And that morning, we get uh, we get in that morning, right? Uh, I mean, it was early in the morning, two, three o'clock in the morning, something like that. Um, and we were able to land, we get, you know, ammo and everything like that, get staged. We can't, since we're, we were supposed to go to where we're supposed to go that first night, but because we were delayed, this is like the, what, the morning of the 21st, I would guess that that would be. Um, we have to wait. There's not enough time to assemble the troops and get them loaded up on vehicles and get them in the position, get us in the position. So we have to wait till the next night to go in. So we're just sitting at the airfield all day, just waiting to go in. Um, but all the whole time we're getting ammo and stuff like that. You know, we can hear the firefighting going on and, you know, the sights and sounds of war. And it was, you know, kind of exciting, but, you know, kind of as a, as a grunt, you know, there's some anticipation, but there's also like, okay, let's do this. Let's get into it. We're here. Let's go. But um, we're waiting for cover darkness and all that kind of stuff. And you mentioned the SEALs, correct me if I'm wrong, but they were tasked, a SEAL team was tasked with taking out Nori where Noriega's private plane was, right? And they yep. lost, they lost some guys in what was a really intense firefight, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, they, they lost a few guys. Uh they're on the ground doing the airplane, but also um a few guys offshore uh drowned. I'm not sure if that was on infill or exfill. Um, yeah, so they lost a they lost a few guys. So second ranger battalions jumping in the units there too. Though eventually that I go there, but the Kurt Muse, Kurt Muse. Yeah, yeah, and um, so everybody's doing that whole night. It's pretty busy, right? And we're just we're just watching the show. We can see all the firefighting going on, and so the air base that you're at, uh, it's separated by uh, you know river uh, roadways and stuff like that. So there's a uh, Whoever's in that side of the airbase, that's kind of what we're only worried about. We're not really too concerned about things, um, but we can see it happening you know, right across the street, literally. And uh, but we have to wait there all day. And and but luckily for us, though, it, it you know we were able to do that. And then um, it's kind of like um, like uh, back in the, the stories of World War II, right? 82nd jumps in and they're waiting for the ground forces to move in so they could be relieved, right? So kind of that's that's what we're doing. And we finally get there the next night and we split up Panama City. You know, we had the jungle side of Panama City, then the, from the city out to the coast, 82nd Airborne had, had the other half. And, you know, basic combat recon patrols, chasing guys, you know, raids and ambushes and, you know, blocking positions and, you know, normal infantry stuff. Well, that and, and that's what I'm really curious about. What type of resistance was Noriega's men, were Noriega's men able to put up? I mean, were they skilled fighters? Did they have the ability to, to really push back? Or once the Americans rolled in, did they just start getting crushed? Yeah, so they initially they left. They left the city. So uh, they so they fought, if they fought, they fought their way out of the city. Uh, different story for all the folks in uh, Rio Hada and all that stuff. That's Second Ranger Battalion and all the other folks scattered around Panama. Um, but uh, sporadic, I guess, 
gunfights going on and they the the battalion 2000 the noriega's army left the city and was regrouping to come back in to take the city when we get on the ground and so that night they leave and the next night they're getting ready to come back so all we saw was sporadic you know gunfighting going on so they'll they'll be sympathizers or whatever i don't know just normal citizens really i call them sympathizers but they're they're on the noriega side of of things and in their thought process um so individuals um which is a little problematic um we had we had uh moving into position one night the the night we get there uh when i when i'm told okay <laughs> okay sorry force i got i'm gonna give you some more guys i'm gonna give you another machine gun team and because the road to your front is the main road that they're coming back through into the city and you know, I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, well, I did that. Uh, you know, uh, let's 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 do it. I got more machine guns. I got more guys. I got more rockets. I got more guns and everything. And so when we we're sealing off this whole area that we were at, we're taking apart literally this this uh, a fence or a, I guess it was a decorative kind of a wall, right? They have these little concrete blocks that they just stack. And then they make the perimeter of their backyards and all that stuff. So we're putting that on the road, making obstacles for vehicles and stuff like that. Um, in order to do that behind us, that's when we got, uh, we were getting shot at. And when we crossed the street, there was a, we're trying to, I was trying to block off this one street behind us and just put debris, whatever debris we can get and put it in the roadway so nobody can come behind us. And um, we crossed the road once cross road twice and by the third time i hear uh, gunshots and not close not accurate it's like a it's like a snapping sound you hear when it's passing by right and i heard it and i was like you know ducked down and moved over to the roadway out of the street and uh i didn't see where it came from i just heard it and um and the, the, i was on one side of the road and where i come from was my other guys so I ran back across the street, heard it again, little snap sound and two snaps. I was like, okay, and then I get an idea where it's coming from. And I still got to get this blocking position in. So I told uh, the, the guys, uh, the guys. so it, it flashed forward to the movie, uh, Black Hawk Down, where that one kid's like, hey, they're shooting at us, right? And the, the Colonel McKnight character says, well, shoot back same shit happened right and so my i get back to my guys i hit the dirt beside them and they're like did did you hear that i was like yes i heard that did you see him and why didn't you shoot back right i was expecting them to start shooting um that's it they couldn't see him that where it came from either and it was it's pitch black so at the at the actual intersection there's this one street light and that was it as soon as you left the, the and that's kind of typical in Panama, just the jungle environment. You, as soon as you leave any illuminated area, I mean, real quickly it goes pitch black. And I ended up doing that a couple of times because the the barricade needed to be built. And every time we cross the road, you hear the couple snaps. And and I kept telling my guys on the ground, it's like, okay, pay attention up there, pay attention down the road, up on the hill. That's where the shots are coming from. And because we, we got to get this done. So as we, I'm dragging stuff out there and another guy's, uh, one of my guys is with me. Um, just dumping stuff off really quick and then running back and, and then one to three, let's go again. And we did that till we blocked the road. Um, and, but never found that dude, never shot at him. Uh, I guess I didn't really, I personally didn't stop and try to shoot. I, I, uh, I made it uh, my last attempt when I dropped the last bear, uh, it was like a, 55 cal gallon drum um i put it out in the middle of the road and i've done that five or six times doing this right and so i stopped in the middle of the road <laughs> right underneath the street light <laughs> and the snaps they're you could tell when they're how close they are and um just by the sound of the crack right and it was uh you know, it's like, okay, I'm standing right here. You missed me six times. I was standing right there and I look up to the hill. I was like, all right, I put my hands out and my arms out. I was like, all right, what? I was like, you guys see anybody? <laughs> I'm trying to highlight this dude so that my guys could shoot him. 
And he's, they're like, I can't see anything. And Sergeant P, as they all call me Sergeant P instead of Sergeant Forrest, um, can't see anything. So I was like, all right. Then I ran off the road and and uh, just called it a night at that point and then messed with the other side. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was the first thing. And raiding and clearing the rooms and the houses that were around us to make sure everything in the, our little area was secure. That was what took up most of the rest of the, our first night there. And then, um, so the battalion 2000 that's supposed to be coming back. We're on this, we're on this, uh, it's a four way intersection and we got it all blocked off the best we can with what we had on the ground. And a couple of, uh, Humvees dropped off some equipment for us, concertina wire and all that kind of stuff. And um, so when they're supposed to come up, well, so that whole night, we can hear the uh, the, spec the AC-130, the Spectre gunship. We can hear, we can see the, the airplane and he's not too far away. And you can, he's, he's hammering somebody down the street, down the road. And we thought just based off looking at maps and stuff that, okay, they're, I hope, they, hopefully they're, I guess, uh, they're hitting the the battalion 2000 that was supposed to come down that road and sure enough they were uh, we didn't find that out till later but um they were they were just hammering whoever was down that road and we're like well i hope they minimize them enough that they're not coming down this road anymore right and um that's exactly what happened and then that whole night was just anticipation of you know meeting that army coming down the road and then we were we were pretty ready we had enough i think uh rockets and claymores we had the whole road just rigged with all kinds of stuff um so we we're ready they never came um but coming down that road is when i first meet the unit guys for the first time and uh so i had the whole road blocked off so there's cars stopped and for the people who were stopped i said they're, they're just not obstacles for the battalion 2000 so get out of your cars i don't care what you're doing just get out of your cars and leave them park them and so i just kind of use that as a uh, a means to block the road or additional means to block the road and uh, <clears throat> one of my guys uh, calls me from the, the sun's coming up and one of my guys calls me to this uh, uh, position he's down the road a little bit and he's talking to somebody and I can see him talking to some guys in a panel van and um, he, he radio squawking I need you to come down here and I was like okay okay I'll be there in a sec I need to get down there there's these two Hispanic guys in the front and it's a panel van with no windows. It's a white panel van. And um, I see the, the guys, as I'm walking toward it, I see the two guys, they're Hispanic. It could be battalion 2000 Panamanians. I don't know. Um, and the, not in uniforms or anything like that. And I asked them what they're doing. They said, Hey, Sergeant, they recognized, you know, Hey, Sergeant, we're, we're uh, we need to get to the um, papal nuncio or, or something like that. It was either the Papal Nuncio or the Covenantia still. I'm not sure which one now, but, um, and we need to get through here. And I had already just trashed this whole road. <laughs> I just trashed it with all these cars and, and claymores and stuff. I was like, and I said, well, don't get off the road because we, we've mined the whole side walls and the, the shoulders and all that stuff. So, um, so let me clear the road and um let the, let you guys through and the the only reason and it was like uh, well what are you doing who are you with what is what's in the back do you have any guns and ammo and yes there's a there's a whoever was down the road and i'm guessing now they were the guys who were who are directing fires on ac-130 down the street all night <laughs> and now they have to get in town um almost positive uh Norega was at the papal nuncio at that point um, but they had to get back in town and um, so parted the waters, um, got everybody out of the way. They they uh, went to wherever they were going. And um, later on, I mean, almost a year later, it wasn't that long after that. Um, when I go to selection, uh, they kept asking me that. They're like, "Hey, will you will you pet them?" It's like, "Yes." They're like, "Hey, you're that guy at the blocking position." And then they're messing with me because the helicopter got shot down with mus in it. Um, they were saying uh, that was a whole nother unit and, uh, in another part of town, but, um, they said, Hey, you're the one who shot us down. I was like, no, I wasn't that guy. I was on the other side of town. I've met your other dudes in the panel van. That's, that was me. Um, and no, we didn't get shot at. We didn't shoot at you or, you know, you guys are good. 
when you stopped him in the van, did you look back in to see who, how many people they had in the van, or could you only see the two people sitting up front? Yeah, no, I, so I had to look, right. I was like, I got to look just if, if you're legit, I got to look. So, um, open it. So me and my, uh, my guy Smitty, he's he's the guy who called me down there. He's like a E4, 203 gunner. And so uh, whatever, <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting to see either, right? So it's, it's like, okay, yes, we do have guns and we do have guys in the back. Okay, so I got to see just to make sure you guys are legit. And so we do this little thing where it's like a, like a, uh, Clearing vehicles, you know, basic infantry stuff, right? That's when he's going to get the door. I'm going to check, get my rifle up and and check the back. And just like going through a room, going through a door. And sure enough, door opens. And here I'm being face to face with with uh, unit guys, you know. Uh, and so I re easily recognize who it is because of the American flags and their uniforms and stuff like that. And um it was, it was one of those things where um, it's almost like I was like, I was at a loss for what to do, what to say, and just like shut the door. And it's like, okay, you guys are good. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> what did what did the guys in the back of the van do when they saw you? Were they just staring at you? Oh yeah, so they were yeah, but they were ready to like, who is this guy? And and when I when I deal with that now, well, or later on when I'm in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, that is that is uh, that is a tense moment when you're you're friendly, but you're not dressed like everybody, and you have these soldiers on the ground who are just ready to go. I mean, they're ready to shoot at anything, right? And that that later on uh, in my career, that becomes you know reality to me. And it's like that. That's uh that's a that is the worst feeling in the world. One to have a gun pointed at you, but to have a jacked up army dude <laughs> who's ready to start killing anything, um, just uh, self preservation, right? Um, but yeah, that was they were ready, just like I was, uh, and it was like okay, well, I guess you guys are good. <laughs> I'm gonna, guess you guys are good. <laughs> that's absolutely incredible, and. Was that the first time? I mean, did you know what Delta Force was before Panama? Like, had you heard about them? Or was that kind of your first introduction to the Tier 1 element? I've heard about them. Um, but at, at, even then, um, even then, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought I was even going to, I was even in that, uh, I guess, uh, capability or in even that wasn't even a thought in my head because i didn't think there's no way there's, a, there's no way i can be one of those guys right so i really never thought about it at the time i was going to sf uh the special forces the uh, green beret side of the house and i'd gone to sf selection already and i was waiting for a qualification course date when panama hits and i was supposed to uh be in panama or be in uh, the Q course for the SF uh, training when this whole thing kicks off. And I think it was January or something like that was my reporting date. And that, that was the, my next move. That was what I was doing on that, that enlistment. And, uh, and no, I was like, no, I didn't, I didn't have a thought in my head, even at that point. And almost a year later, I'm in tryouts and, and Delta selection and, and that's when, uh, so yeah, let me, so I, so I get back from Panama and when I get back from Panama, I expect, I say, I tell the SF recruiter, I was like, Hey man, um, I'm done. I'm ready to go. Got a little delayed because of Panama and there's a thing, your selection has to be current within six months of your reporting date from SFA as the SF selection course. And that had expired while I was in Panama. So their thought was. I got to go back to SF selection. I was like, all right, well, that kind of sucks, but um, all right, whatever I got to do, right? So I get another class date for that. And in the meantime, uh, a couple of the guys at the 7th Infantry Division get these, they mail out these cards to people to attend the, the Delta briefing. And 
they've already been administratively checked, I guess, their their records and stuff like that. I didn't get it, but I didn't get one of those cards. But um, they said I can come with them if if I wanted to. Um, they said if uh, if you know anybody else interested, just bring them with you. Um, and then so I went with these guys, and they weren't they weren't even interested in it. They just thought, hey, this is a cool thing, and it's mandatory. If you get the card, if you get the letter, it's like a uh, like through official mail in the in the army, you get uh like a it's almost like a postcard size thing. It says your your attendance to this is mandatory, and you can't get out of it. There's no excuses. Nobody can stop you from attending, and all this other stuff. So it sounded pretty important to those guys, and they told me about it. I was like, yeah, let me go. Let me I'll go with you. See what this is all about. And man, since uh, just sitting through that briefing. And I don't remember even a lot of things in it. The, one of the things I do remember is um, they were just very honest about what life there is. They said it was difficult on families. They're going to be deployed a lot because they um, there was a lot of the questions the guys that were there were asking. This is like in a theater, in a base, uh, a base theater. So there's a lot of people in this thing. And um, they gave you the briefing. They say you're, uh, you're not always... So deployment's one thing, right? Families don't care if you're deployed on training or real world missions. You're gone, you're gone. And they said, you're going to be gone. Um, you're going to be training. If you're not training, you're always training to deploy. You're always working up for that. And all the things going on in the world, um, if you pay attention, I mean, there's all, always something going on. And um, so that was one of the things that stuck in my head. Um, another one was... Um, one, I had this one cool video <laughs> and it was just a, uh, you know, an assault and guys running around and shooting guns and, you know, helicopters all over the place. It was kind of cool. And um, that was a very short clip though, of what it was like. And then they, at the end somewhere, they add, or they say something to the effect of, you know, uh, your only failure is your, your failure to try, right? If you come in and you don't make it, no big deal. Um, no questions asked, right? It's like, you know what, you just, it's not for everybody and that's what you're going to go find out. Um, and so that stuck with me too. It's like, wow, that's pretty cool. I mean, and literally, and then I recalled back in my 82nd Airborne days, back in the early 80s, almost like six years before that, two guys had went to tryout. So they didn't say anything about it. They just said, we're going to this tryout thing. And then word of mouth, you know, they just went to the selection, the briefing and did the PT test. And now they're going to go, to this uh, selection course they can't talk about. And so we got, we knew where they were going and they didn't make it. And they came back to the unit and uh, in the 82nd and um, they they said, uh, you know, we were like, well, how had to go? How was it? And all this other stuff. And we're like, well, we were told not to talk about it, but that was the best thing I'd ever done in my life. And it's like, so you, you made it. And they said, no. <laughs> and we're like, well, how is that the best thing you did in your life? You know, because typically in the army, if you don't complete a course, you're you're a failure, you know, and it looks bad on your records, and you don't get promoted and everything else. That has nothing to do with that, just the selection course at all. You, and and now knowing it, um, one of the guys, uh, actually, they both said it at one different times. One guy came back earlier than the other, and they both said, um, you know what? I gave it everything I got and I just, it just wasn't enough. And I, I couldn't, I don't have, I don't, I don't have any more to give. So, and, cause we're all asking, are you going back? And they're like, oh, hell no. <laughs> it was, I don't have it. I'm not what they need. I'm not what they, I, I'm not going back. And it's like, but they felt good about what they did. Right. About how like they, they gave literally everything they got, but just didn't make it. And we're, we're very up, honest with themselves and said, well, uh, I guess I'm not going to, I'm not what they need. And that kind of, that didn't hit me. Um, I didn't recall that going through selection when I went to uh, Delta selection until way late in my, in the process when I was going through it. And I said, uh, I was thinking, um, as I recall what they said, <laughs> and, and they tell you, all you do, all we want from you is uh, the best that you could do. And we'll assess if that's good enough or not. Don't worry. Don't you concern yourself with, you know, with that. But of course, um, all the guys that are there, including myself, we're trying to, we're trying to do, I mean, literally push 
push ourselves as hard as we can every day. Cause you don't know when the day ends, you don't know when the, the, what your walking distance is or your, whatever you're going to do. Right. Um, and my mindset at the first time I go, cause I didn't make the first one was, well, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to push myself till I die. I mean, they, they can't kill me, but I can push myself and kill myself. Right. <laughs> but break a bone or something. I'm gonna, I'm just going to keep going and do the best I can at whatever they tell me to do. And I was thinking, well, I've already got the rucksack. I'm a grunt. I, I do 50, 20, hundred mile road marches. I should be good on the, that, that end. Um, but yeah, not the case. I didn't do any specialty training or anything like that the first time. And then, uh, yeah, that was, that kicked my butt. So, but then I just trained better the next time because they did allow me to come back, obviously, for the second time. And the only difference was I just did more preparation, just to get myself physically better prepared for what was about to come. So I, I have a question on, on that. I've had a couple guys from Delta tell me that one of the most unnerving or maybe mentally mess with you things is like if they come from the Rangers they're used to getting yelled at in training. They're used to all that stuff. And, and, but they said, it's not like that at all in selection. No one's yelling at you. No one's in your face. You're just alone with, with your instructions. And some guys, they say just, they can't handle that. Like they just can't do it. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Um, Cause I didn't know what to expect. So some of the guys know guys that are in the unit and, and they don't get told, they're not told anything. So even myself later on when I was there and and a, a guy comes through and he's like, hey, I'm getting ready to go to selection. What do you have? You know, do you have any tips or motivational things I can, you know, I was like, nope, I'm not going to tell you, you know, have a good, you know, do the best you can. That's all I said. Do the best you can. And um, so it's a very, uh, I don't know that anybody. So there are some people who know guys there. I didn't know anybody that was at the unit. Um so I, I didn't know anybody to ask. I didn't know anybody to talk to. Um, I just trained what I thought was, you know, what I needed to be training myself in. And some of the guys that show up there. So I was in, so I, I tried out first. I was at Fort Ord. Then I get deployed to Korea. And that's where I go the second time. That's where I'm at when I go to the second time. And the uh, selection sergeant major that was there, he recognized me. And that was, that was odd for me because of all the people that showed up in Korea. So we ha we have to make two days. It's two days. I was way up north in DMZ. So all the people that are in Korea that are going to this meeting are coming from bases scattered all over South Korea. And it takes me two days to get down there. And I finally show up the day of the, the, the PT test. And uh, the uh, the sergeant major at the time, he, he's, he asked me, he's like, hey, sort of force. And I was like, Oh shit. I saw him walking. There's only one place that was open that early in the morning at this one base that we were doing the PT test. And so everybody's going there. I go there to get uh coffee and they went there to do the same thing. And uh, he said, Hey, sir, Morris, how? he goes, so you ready? And I was like, how do you even know my name? First of all, that might not be such a good idea. <laughs> it might not be such a good thing that you know my name already, but um I said, well, I'm ready. And then he said, um, I'm as ready as I can be. And all I'm going to do is do the best I can again and see if it's, I can do better this time. And he's like, okay. So he goes, good for you. Good for you. Um, so he goes, how, just give me a, give me your best get. Have all the people that you're coming here with that are here. How many do you think are really motivated to do this? And I was like, well, and I knew that some of the guys that were there and I was like, well, and there was probably 30 or 40 people at this place. I said, maybe one other is really motivated to do this. He's like, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and they're just trying to get out of a, a deployment to Korea. As most of them, that's what they're trying to do. They think if they don't make it, they can just go to a stateside assignment, and get out of their Korea assignment. So that was, that was unfortunately some of the, some of the motivations for some of the folks to even go to this PT test and try out. But um, when you get there in the first week, it, you're waiting for people just to arrive from all the places like Korea, right? Germany. And they're coming from all over the world to go to this selection. And, 
and nobody tells you nobody yeah like you say it right the other guy said that nobody nobody's yelling at you you're not told you're not even told to get in like so little by little they're trying to give you less information right so like for forming like it would be like a formation at whatever time right and then all they would do is tell you your instructions are on the board and it's a dry erase board in the hallway and while you're out in formation somebody wrote the next instructions for you to do and it's not like a like a dismissal like a formal you know formation in the military like okay everybody dismissed <laughs> it's just like your neck your information is on the board and then they leave <laughs> and so the guys are so really regimented in the army life right like well can we move can we leave can we go check it and uh that it just within a few days people are quitting because of that um like be in formation in the morning or be at the dining facility at this time and so typically in the army you know if you have like let's say seven o'clock in the dining facility for breakfast that's when breakfast starts then you back that up for a formation right to to march to the dining facility right so you add 30 minutes to that so 6 30 be in formation and then everybody says okay individually i got to be there 15 minutes before that one so it just it gets to be a mess you're there at five o'clock in the morning for a seven o'clock meeting right kind of thing and then um so guys are out there they're waking up and you hear alarms going watch you know watches and stuff like that going off and um so we're talking uh no cell phones at the time so everybody's at literally they have like travel uh clocks and those little bells and other thing going off for their alarms just so they can be out there at you know six o'clock in the morning for a seven o'clock formation or be at the dining facility and so for some of us and they're expecting at one point in the night like uh range of school or basic training or something like that that sometime in the night like two three o'clock in the morning they're gonna come in storming and yelling and flashbangs everywhere and trash cans in the hallway to wake you up and none of that happens <laughs> and that that is the weirdest thing. And I thought that people actually started quitting because of that. And it's a, it was driving them crazy. Um, and I was just, I was like, I, I can, I can work with this, you know, uh, I'm going to sleep as long as I can sleep. I'm going to eat whenever I eat, <laughs> walk until they tell me to stop. Right. And just keep going. But yeah, a lot of guys quit that first week and we're not even doing anything. One of the other things uh, I've heard guys from your unit say is that it's not uncommon for some people to show up, you know, big muscles, maybe a bit of a meathead, loud talker. And as one of your former, uh, you would overlap with this guy. I don't know for how long he, he said, you can take one look at those guys and they're gone within the first 72 hours. A lot of the time. And it's yep. like, that's what fascinates me. And I think what fascinates the viewers is you see the movies and you think these guys are all Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he's like, when you get there, those guys, especially if they can't keep their mouth shut and they can't keep their ego in check, they're not ready. He's like 72 hours. See you later. Go on. Yeah. Absolutely. It's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. It's uh, to see it happen that way. Um, and I've seen that. It's, it's the same thing with combat too. Like the, the people who are talking smack, all the stuff before Panama. And in, in my case, um, the false motivation and all that stuff and, and, you know, whatever, it's just, uh, those are the ones that don't end up performing. And the, the quiet, the, my guys, the, all the quiet soldiers and everybody who's just, you know, uh, performing, they're just doing what they do. Um, we're the ones who excelled in that, in that environment. Same thing when you get to the selection and you see those guys. Um, yeah. Some of them can't even pass the PT test. And it's, it's like, what, what do you, how do you, how can you not pass a PT test? You knew you were taking one, but the big guys, right. It's just too much. Uh, swim. Uh, there was a, there used to be a swim test. Uh, that was getting them a lot. The run was getting them a lot. Um, a lot of it is, uh, a lot of it was, uh, from my perspective, from my, just observing everybody, that like the big guys, uh, they they tried too hard, especially like in the running and the PT test kind of stuff. Um, they just didn't have it. They just had the cardio for it. Um, and then they tried to keep up with the, these little guys who are passing them. And then their whole macho thing took over. And I was like, oh, that little guy's not going to beat me. And then he just gassed out and couldn't pass. Um, 
So it is really interesting. I thought it was like one of the one of the many things that just intrigued me about it the first time was the dynamics of how they how it's run and what actually happens. Like who's there really uh, in the in the end? Do you uh, well, what year do you get through selection and go to OTC then? Ninety to ninety one. So okay, so yep, all of ninety. I'm going through selection and right after. Um, the, I get back from Panama. It's like I'm getting go to Korea and then go to um, uh, selection. OTC for viewers who might not know is the operators training course. It's you know it's the step before you officially become the thing. What was your when you go to OTC? What did you think was going to happen? Did you think you were going to be doing like ninja things? And then what actually? Because my understanding is OTC, you become the greatest person on the planet at the basics to the point you cannot screw up any of the basics. Is that accurate to say? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'd agree with that. And uh, the basics at everything. Right. So, and not just the hard skills, the shooting and the CQB stuff, but you get, you get a lot of training, um, you know, driving training, security driving training and psychological evals and, uh, vision tests and uh, acuity tests. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And there's always a physical fitness aspect to everything, of course. Um, and there's no, there's no, so in the, on the army that I can speak to the army about, you know, typically you have uh, PT formation in the morning. That's how you start your day. And then you just do whatever it is your job is uh, in the army rest of the day so there is no structured stuff like that like you're doing pt you got to get it though you got to get it somewhere you got to squeeze it in the schedule and because just the physical activities that you do everything's going to require some sort of physical activity um some a lot of academic stuff going on about uh concepts of you know even in the protection side of the house um Oh man, it's so many things. Uh, the hard skills, the soft skills, the admin stuff. Um, yeah, it is. It is just jam packed with so much stuff, and, and shooting a lot of shooting. <laughs> um, uh, and it's really kind of neat the way it, it's run, and because um, it's not a uh, nobody's screaming at you. Still, it's just it's a more of a mentor coaching kind of a uh, atmosphere that the instructors have, right? And they counsel you every day about how you're performing and where do you need to be. And um, yeah, it's pretty neat. It's a, it's a, it, the, the, it's hard because it's just physically demanding, mentally demanding. Um, it, it's not a, it's not a gut check anymore. It's just, you're going to learn how to be, you know, the best soldier, the fundamentals. You're going to learn how to be the best person, the best soldier, the best operator. Uh, for lack of a better term, I hate that word, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's it just so how to how to work around helicopters, even though if you've been around before or not, you're going to do that again, and how to do it right, um, and it's it's one of those things where um, a lot of things you do very common sense, but you've maybe taken shortcuts because um, the 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 thing. <laughs> The thing I've heard after that too, the funny thing I've heard after that, it's like, well, that's what you guys do behind the fence, right? I was like, yeah, no, I don't do that. <laughs> and so you go in thinking like, there's going to be, they're going to teach me this magic trick to shortcut all this stuff. And there's, uh, guess what? There is no magic trick. I learn the fundamentals and be proficient at, at those because guess what? That you just keep, it's going to keep escalating. Um, but yeah, it was, it was long hours, long days, long nights. Um, it was awesome. Um, and, and very little tolerance for mistakes. Right. So that was the thing. I don't, I don't remember, um, I don't remember being stressed out about that, but I remember others being stressed out about that. Uh, like the, the, uh, performance, right. Very, very, uh, strict standards and, to me, I kind of adopted it as, um, all right, well, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's no room for error. And this is my, this is, could be, you know, what makes or breaks me. But to me, it was like, well, I didn't, I didn't, I went through all this stuff to get here. I'm not going to screw it up now. 
Um, and of course I made mistakes, but it, there was, you know, coaching, mentoring, Hey, do it this way. I saw you do this, do it this way. It's going to be better and all this stuff. Um, so I was just like a sponge absorbing all this stuff. And I equated it to my infantry days. And it's very similar, uh, task when you get down to individual stuff, um, like individual soldier tasks, the shooting and moving and communicate. And it's the same stuff. You're just getting more proficient at it. And there is no shortcuts and it's all about, it's all about performance at the highest level. And they won't push you past like the fundamentals because they keep going back to the fundamentals every time. Um, some of the guys, even uh, in my class in OTC were, well, I can't wait to get that, the, the next level training. Right. And guess what? There is no next level. We're just going to keep getting better at what we're doing. And that elevates you to the next level just automatically um yeah it's a pretty neat pretty neat process when it comes to the shooting is and i cannot wait to pick your brain on this obviously delta force shooters are you know correctly viewed as the best combat shooters on the planet can you do you have to be kind of born with a natural instinct for something like that or could you with enough training could someone like me if I spend six months doing it, could I get good enough or is there an X factor that you either have it or you don't have it if you're going to shoot at that level? Yeah, I would say, um, I would say, uh, it's a certain type that is able to have that kind of, um, and excel at that training, that type of thing, right. Shooting in this case. Um, but really it, it that applies to all that stuff. Um, Cause we've had some good shooters and uh, they couldn't grasp like uh, CQB principles or concepts or something like that. Um, but shooting in general, I think same thing with competition shooters. I think um, you really got to want to do it to, to get better every day. You want to be better than your last performance. Right. Um, so I think it's, it's, um, it's kind of an athletic thing too, professional sports and all that stuff. Right. How do I get better at what I'm doing? Um, I've heard, I know I didn't play professional sports, but I guess the, the, it's like, a. it is the, it is like the, you were in, the, in my mind, it was like, you're getting ready to play, you know, the Super Bowl. you're getting ready to be on the team, you know, that plays in the Super Bowl. Um, and so that's kind of my, what was in my head the whole time. It's like, well, like, how do I get better? I'm asking the guys, what are we, what can we do better? And, and really it's, well, we kept falling back to the fundamentals and the basics, keep getting back to that and just master the basics really in whatever it is we're doing and, and you'll be fine. And, uh, everybody keep the, the guys that have, the guys that struggle are the ones that are thinking there's, there's, I'm going to be given this, <laughs> this key to the code of, you know, commando life. Right. And the code is master the basics. And, uh, I still do that. Uh, every once in a while, go back to the basics and, uh, you know, uh, kind of remind myself that that's the key to success and, uh, and then push myself harder, um, whatever, whatever I'm doing. And, uh, it, it i tell you what that's that's a hard thing for a lot of folks to learn and so when you get to that level though when you get to that that point in otc where, so we started i don't know there was gosh dang 200 something people that started in selection and we end up in my class with i don't know a dozen i think 12 or 13 or something like that so when you get to that point um i guess psychologically it, you're all you already share that kind of mindset and there is no um competition amongst each other and there's no animosity like where did you come from uh kind of stuff at that point because you're so focused on getting getting onto a team and not into a squadron that um you're just concerned about your or concerned but you're just trying to perform to your best and there's uh i don't even know the guys that were i mean they came from all walks of life a lot of them come from sf communities ranger battalions uh, i think we had a, a air crew crew chief in my class um so infantry sf all walks of life and we all got to this one point one spot and it doesn't matter where they came from at this point we're all here now and we're gonna 
you know, try to try to get on the no, try to second. That's the thing too. You don't try to second guess a meaning. It's very clear, concise. There's no secret code here. You do what we tell you to do, how we tell you to do it, and you'll be fine. Very, very simple task. I love that. So what it must be about early 92, late 91, when you finally get assigned to your squadron. Yeah. Late 91, I think. And, and as a new guy coming into a squadron, you've done selection, you've done OTC. Is it the, is the expectation the day you arrived to the squadron, you better be ready. If we get a phone call tonight, you better be ready right now to keep up with the rest of us. Like there's no, there's no transition period. Once you hit that squadron, you're expected to roll. Yep. Yes, but you're not. <laughs> <laughs> there's so that was the thing too. It is it yeah, right now, because that day, and I did the same thing to a new guy on the team later on, but that day, that as soon as you drop the few bags that you have, you're getting more bags. And you got to be prepared to deploy like right now. And so you do that for the before you leave and that's that's those are the orders that are given to you before you leave uh work today um have all these bags packed so you're packing for winter a deployment a winter worker place right and then you're packing for the desert you got another group of bags for the desert and then you have your uh hostage rescue you know kit and then you have you know any number of other things there's like four or five different bags you got to pack and you have all this stuff you've just been issued and you got to find the right stuff, put it in the right bags and before you leave that day. But yeah, it, but I mean, when I got to, got to uh, the team I went to and everybody has the same experience from what I hear. Um, the first time you go and do CQB with any of these dudes, it's just like, oh shit. I thought, so you pass out DC and you think you got it. You're like, I'm ready. I'm good. And, and you are good based off of that group you were with, but they're all new guys too. And as soon as you get to a team, it is just amazing um, how fast and smooth everything goes. And it's it goes fast because it's smooth. And the first time I noticed that, uh, I was like, wow, this is, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> this is like, this is next level stuff right here. And um yeah, it's, it's pretty neat to see that because I was way, you know, everybody gets to their teams and I think, yes, we're ready to go and pack my bags and let's do it. Um, but yeah, oh my God. Yeah, it was incredible. Um, and everybody has that same kind of experience when they get to their team. Um, and when I finally was at the point where there's new guys coming behind me, I'm doing the same thing to them, right? Say, hey, before you leave tonight, you know, pack all these bags. And then you, you get a guy running around with a, you know, the laundry list of things going in the bag and they're doing this. I don't know what anything's called. I don't know what this is. It's like, just pack your bags, right? Um, and then the first time you do CQB or something, uh, they're in the same kind of thing. It's like, look back and say, come on, new guy, get up here. You know, keep up. And it's pretty neat. You had been in the unit at this point uh, when Somalia went down for about a year, year and a half. Yeah. Um, you, correct me if I'm wrong, you were not on Sea Squadron. You weren't in Somalia. Nope. But do you remember, like, did word start coming back to Fort Bragg that something had happened? When did other oh. unit members realize that something really, really bad is unfolding in Mogadishu? Yeah, well, um, probably almost immediately. Um, so, so we started. That started in '92. Uh, the prep for that, and I was on the initial. The I think we were the first ones. They actually have. We were in a mission cycle. So in our mission cycle, I think we were on mission cycle when that first came down. We did our rehearsals and stuff like that. Ended up uh, rotating out of those. Uh, cycles and we were uh, I think in uh, support we were supported in our support cycle when that goes down and so I was in West Virginia the squadron um, I was in was in West Virginia running selection and um, yeah they called they called us in uh, to the the team the team meeting room and said this is what happened I think USA Today had something out in the news already um, 
So they went downtown and got a newspaper and told us what was happening, gave us the updates. We're like, what the hell's going on? So they were going to replace us. So we flew back to Bragg. Um, another squadron went over there immediately. And we're going back to Bragg because we're in a support cycle. We don't have, we're not ready, you know, bags and stuff like that. We're not ready to deploy immediately. So we're going to go assume the what's called uh, like an alert uh, squadron status and for anything else that pops up. And that's what we did. Um, but I was talking to, you now I was a team breacher at the time. So the breacher that was over there was Sea Squadron. I was talking to him all the time. Um, and then through, you know, uh, official channels and all that stuff. And so what we were doing uh, back at Bragg was, hey, we had this target, this this particular whatever, this breach. We had a different breach point. We, had, we put this charge together. It didn't quite work so well figure out back there uh, what will work better for us, right? So I was doing that with all the other breachers uh, back at Bragg when they were over there. Um, but other than that, yeah, it was almost immediately we were told what was going on. And the other squadron took off. They were at Bragg. They, they took off uh, at some point during that night. Did you know any of the unit operators? Because I know that it's obviously a very small knit community. You know, there's not too many guys. Did you personally know any of the Delta guys who were KIA in in Mogadishu? Um, not real well. I was a new guy, so I still wasn't allowed to talk to a lot of folks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, some of their new guys, um, I only met. Um. No, Randy Shugart and uh, Gary Gordon. I met those guys. Now, they, to me though, they were they were like some of the like the cool guys when I got there because I was a new guy, right? I only met them in passing in the hallway because I was with the guys I was with, uh, my team sergeants and and all that stuff, uh, heading to the defect. That's the only time I met those guys. Um, so I didn't know them. I I met them. Um, uh, a lot of the guys that were there were in my OTC class. They weren't. They were injured, but not okay. Um, oh, what's the other book? They just wrote a good book, I think, not too long ago. Um, and it's more of a unit guy perspective on the whole thing, which is a little bit better of a read. Um, uh, oh, man, I can't think of the name of the book. No. Um, yeah, I'll have to send you that information. It's a pretty good read. Um, and, it's, and it's a totally different perspective on things that were going on. Because the... The, the fact that the fact that this happened um and it was a it was a, so it was a bad day right but from a unit guy's perspective it was like okay that was a bad day let's let's get back in it right um we're still here kind of thing so from uh but from a combat readiness perspective you know uh c squadron that was there was you know not not in a, a good way so but the other squadron that was going over there that's like let's continue operations um, and that's why they went, but then everything got shut down and that kind of was not a good feeling to have to be, you know, not, not to, not, not because it was vengeful or we wanted revenge and all that stuff, but, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, the national command authority at the time, uh, really didn't know how to, um, in my my opinion only my perspective <laughs> didn't know how to work with special operations especially us at the time like a unit like um, like you know like us and you know that's that so it was a, su a successful mission but guys were lost and injured uh so combat effectiveness of c squadron was kind of not where it needed to be but uh the other squadron that went perfectly fine perfectly capable to continue ops and then it got shut down. I kind of pissed everybody off for a little bit. Um, but, you know, that was, you know, sign of the times. Is it is the thinking, did it upset people? Because the logic is, and I'm, I'm an outsider, but this is what I would guess when I'm looking at it was, hey, we just lost 19 guys. This mission was important enough for 19 guys to sacrifice their lives. Why is it not important enough to finish? Was that the thinking or was there a different reason guys were upset? Yeah, that that's it. You know, so that that mission that night was a uh, success, right? But the overall mission, it's still ongoing. We don't have a deed yet kind of thing, right? So let's go get the guy. Let's keep going. Um, just not the way it worked out. 
Yeah, no, definitely not. Uh, it's a great movie, by the way. You'll have to send me. You'll have to send me the name of the book. I'll definitely be interested in checking it out from a unit operator's perspective. I yeah. do want to ask you. In the 90s, again, people my age, when we think of the unit, special operations, we think of the war on terror, you know, Afghanistan, hunting Al-Qaeda, Iraq, all that stuff. But in the 90s, a little bit of a different situation, right? I mean, what are the what are the big things? You've got the drug cartel situation. You've got the Balkans. Like, was that kind of what you guys at that time period were focused on? Oh, man, Yes. So many things going on then. Oh, Day of the Rangers. Day of the Rangers. Okay, Definitely. I'll look it up for sure. Yeah. Um, so, so that so ninety ninety one, and I show up in ninety one. So we're on the heels of the Gulf War, right? And so for the rest of the nineties, there's still the no no fly zone that the us and the coalition forces are um, enforcing in Iraq. So there there's that. There's the search for weapons of mass destruction that's going on in Iraq. <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, the Pablo Escobar deal down in Colombia is still going on. And so these are all the things that are going on that uh, globally that we're paying attention to. Um, in the early 90s, all that stuff is going on. The Oklahoma City bombing also in the States. So that's a that's a nexus to um, Al-Qaeda, you know, uh, training as well with uh what's his nuts that did that um uh timothy mcveigh yeah yeah um man the everything leading up to to, to 9 11 right the kenya bombings the embassy kenya bombings i mean all these things are going on there's so many things going on um that it it's uh you don't lose perspective on what you're why you're there because uh, every week, every day, twice a week, at least, you're getting intel updates on what's what's happening and where we're getting ready to, where should we be focusing our efforts on? Um, Cobar Towers, I think. Uh, oh, man, there's so many things going on. Uh, down helicopters um, re are uh, enforcing no-fly zone in Iraq. Uh, oh, man, there's a, uh, oh, who's, uh, the Japanese embassy in Peru was taken. Um that was a, that was one of the alerts I was on, but then they released the Americans and and then we're off. We don't have anything to do with it anymore. Oh uh, man, there's so many things. Um, well, can I, can I can I ask you uh, about uh, two things? I, I because you mentioned Escobar. Uh, I think Eric Hanley in his book Inside Delta Force mentions the hunt for Escobar and all that stuff. And there have been some other authors that have written books. And there's this, I don't know if you call it an urban myth or a legend or whatever might have you. I've never asked a guest this before, but I'm curious to see. And you don't have to answer if you don't want to. There's long been this legend, this rumor that it was a unit sniper that smoked Escobar on that rooftop. Is that true or do you not have any knowledge of that? I don't have any knowledge of that. Okay. I had to ask, just I've yeah. never asked anyone before. But were you involved in any way when it came to battling the uh the drug cartels or anything like that? So uh just at training training the folks that were down there. And that was kind of a big thing with most people, I think. Um seventh SF group was involved in that too. Um just training them to do CQB and shooting and all that stuff. I can't remember the name of their their um there's CT SWAT guys, but, um, that was it. Gotcha. I did. I was going through your Instagram account and I saw a picture of you with, uh, it's a woman with her face blacked out. There's another guy with his face blacked out. And then, um, I, his name's slipping me, but he died in that vehicle explosion in Iraq in Oh five. I think he was of Serbian or Croatian, uh, descent. You know yeah. who I'm talking about? Croatian, Abika. Yeah. Yeah, the guy's a leg the guy's a legend in the in the special operations world. That picture is that in the Balkans? Um, yeah, Evita it and wearing his band right now. As a matter there fact. you go. <laughs> yes, that was. Um, so people again my age have no idea that there was even in you know the the Serbs and all that stuff. Can you explain kind of what? the U S role was in that whole situation and what your or the American role in the war criminals and the war crimes. Yeah. So, um, the Serbs, so from the beginning, um, they're the, 
Serbs. So it seemed like a typical Christian Muslim fight again, right? For primacy of now the whole that the Balkans area this splitting up and people are getting their own independence and forming their own little countries and stuff like that. Um, the Serbs are doing a bunch of stuff to get to the point to be the, I guess the people in Bosnia at the time, uh, the the power the party in power, and just uh, horrible uh, like mass killings and uh, killing civilians and non combatants that what we consider non combatants you know just regular civilians. Um, I remember um, uh, Christian Mampour was in on the ground when they had the trenches in in uh, Bosnia and in uh, uh, Sarajevo, and that's how they had to get from one side of the street to the other. They dug trenches, and then they uh, made holes in walls so they didn't have to come out because the Serb snipers would shoot them on the street. Just civilians weren't running around the street, and um, th yeah, it was just crazy if there was a funeral going on uh you know they'd get they get mortared or shot at from snipers and it was just and literally mass killings they'd line up you know the the croatians uh or the so the serbs killing croats uh kind of thing right and so we're we're finding all these other things all these mass graves and everything else and then eventually escalates to okay now they're going to be indicted by the hague for war crimes and then that's when we go in to try to capture these guys. Us, and, the, Brit, the French, we all had it, had it all divided up. And I was watching a documentary put out by CNN or HBO, one of the two. And the documentary interviewed a couple of your old teammates. And one of the points they made, it was like, it was made very clear to us. The goal is we have to capture these guys alive. We can't run up and shoot them. We have to get them alive because they have to go to trial. Yeah. What was the, was that simply the logic? Like we just want to put them on trial. Why were they so adamant? We got to take these guys alive. That I'm not too sure. So all the geopolitical stuff behind all that stuff at the time, I wasn't too concerned about that. I was like in my mode as a commando, you know, kill or capture. Just tell, let me know which one. <laughs> and so that's all I was doing. <laughs> I wasn't too yeah. wrapped up in the, the wise. Just do it. When you were in a situation, was there anything about that deployment or however long that lasted for you in the Balkans, in that area that really surprised you? Is there anything you went in that other than obviously mass graves and the level of heinous evil, but yeah. doing a job like that where you're hunting war criminals, was there anything that really was unexpected about that? Um, not well, unexpected, uh, not so much, except, um, in the operational environment that you, we, I know I had in my head and most of the guys did is you're used to not like, if you have a safe haven, like, where are you going to, if something happens, where am I going to go? Where's a safe place to hide? Where's a safe place, place to run or something like that. Um, it came from the Muslim side of the house. So you, you would go to a mosque and seek uh, refuge if you have to, right. If you're on the lamb and you're go somewhere. And so that's not a typical thing that we had in our heads to be able to do. And so it was totally inverse as far as that's concerned. Um, that was the, that was the weirdest thing. That was the weird dynamics of all that whole place and and operating in that area. Otherwise, it was um, it was pretty neat. So the it was a, a combination of clandestine work to get into these places and to get so the I become the guy in the front seat of this panel van, right? That I ran into in Panama, right? <laughs> now I'm that guy driving, you know, assault teams across into their, uh, you know, blocky positions, assault position, whatever they're going to, right? And I'm sneaking them around in the back of my little delivery truck, you know, dealing with the checkpoints and all that kind of stuff. So that was, uh, that was when I got there, uh, and I realized I was like, oh, look at me now. I'm that guy in, in the panel van that I ran into in Panama now. Um, but yeah, it was it was kind of neat. So that the mod squad we were called, that team you see the picture, um that was us. Uh, and we were responsible to do most of the mission planning and getting um 
and we were working at at our squadron headquarters level. So we're working now to get all the assault teams and the sniper teams into wherever they need to go, sneaking them around town, going from safe house to safe house to their positions and and, and just sneaking them around the country that way. Um, yeah, that was that was a really a very dynamic um environment that we were in out there because i'd be in civilian clothes you know in the front seat of these cars and then we get to a place and get my uniform back on and jump in the you know assault positions and wherever I, you know the team was at um so it's kind of neat um and we did that we did that for from mid to late 90s did the, I got to ask because I, it's so rare you see it in a photo like that. And I know her face is blacked out and I would never ask you to give someone's name. But I think a lot of people would be surprised by that photo because there's a woman in it. And maybe they yeah. think, you know, why is there a woman with these commandos is what's what's the explanation for why you have a woman in a situation? You know, was she was she an American? Things of that nature. Yeah, uh, she's our teammate. Um yeah, and she had uh, language capability out there too. Gotcha. So, um, to so to benefit us, um, so in our in our clandestine side, right? When we're working that way, um, you're least likely to suspect a couple, or if it's a woman, a woman more than a man, right? To be a bad actor or somebody that doesn't belong, right? So we adopted that back then in those days. Um, so we had women assaulters. Uh, they were a part of another uh, group that uh, I don't want to say was a, was in support of the squadron, but um, there there obviously wasn't a lot of them. So uh, the the core of uh, the women that were doing that would go to wherever the squadron, whatever squadron was deploying, right? Um, so they worked with everybody. Um, and this one happened to have the language out there, uh, Serbo Croatian. And so she was talking to the checkpoints and the folks at the checkpoints and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's helped out. She's, she's a shooter just like the rest of us. That's incredible. Hey, and good for her. And I, and I see some people who get so confused or maybe it's just, I, I don't have a good word for it, but I've seen debates about that before. I've heard other guys discuss it and it's like, some guys can't wrap their head around that. And it's like, do you not think there's some badass? women out there i guarantee you that there absolutely is absolutely and there you go there's one right there you go and and i'll that photo if you if you haven't seen it you can find it on bob's instagram it is it, it is such a casually badass photo i mean the whole thing is awesome and like you said your former teammate who was killed uh killed in 05 i actually interviewed one of the guys yeah. that that survived he, he was seriously seriously injured but survived uh, that that explosion that they hit. I do want to talk now, kind of your transition um, into your next phase of life. But first, nine eleven. Were you still in the unit and in the military when nine eleven happened, or had you already left? I had just retired uh, two months before that. No kidding, you were out two months before nine eleven. Yep. That yep. is. So, were you thinking to yourself? damn it, I should have stayed in or were you fine being out? Yeah, no, more the damn it, I should have, uh, should have stayed in. But at the time, so like I mentioned, there's, if you, uh, we're, there was a lot of things going on in the 90s. Bosnia was one of them, but constantly coming and going. And, and my thought process in retirement is like, well, what else can happen, right? I mean, they were already, constantly going from place to place and, and uh, deploying places. Um, and that's what I said. I was like, well, um, you know, it's not like we're going to, we're just going to keep doing the same thing. So, okay, that's time to go. And I wanted to get out and focus because we were deploying so much. Um, I was going to college there uh, part-time in uh, Fort Bragg area and Fort Bragg uh, but I kept having to cancel courses because we we're deploying, right? And I was like, man, I got to get this done. But I, I can't complete a whole semester without having to cancel a course. Um, so that was kind of in my head, too. It was like, well, let me get out. I go full time and get get it done. And I got to get I got to get um, got to try this, you know, regular life <laughs> and uh, two months. And I, I went to D.C. and I was in D.C., uh, probably the week before the planes fell out of the sky. 
uh, going to interviews. So State Department um, and the Secret Service and got accepted by both. I didn't pull the trigger on either one. I just kind of both said, OK, I'm going to take a trip across the country, do my retirement, drive across country and chill out for a minute and made it to uh, the gal I was dating at the time. She we we're going to stop in Texas, visit her folks and her family and then continue on to California to visit my family. And just make a whole, you know, drive, just casual drive around the country. And so we made it to Texas. And that's where that's where that happens, where I was when we got the news that the planes are falling out of the sky and, and all that stuff. Was there ever an opportunity? Would there have been an opportunity for you to have gone back into the unit? If you'd called them and said, hey, I, I'm, I'll come back. If you guys are going to deploy, I, I'll come back. Or once you're out, is that door kind of shut and it's not opening up? No, it was it was uh, available, and I've seen that happen before. <clears throat> and I called a, uh, a buddy of mine, um, and I was like, "Hey, man, is it is it worth me coming back?" And I, I mean, what are we doing? I mean, is there anything going on? And I know the process because um, we get, we get spun up for a lot of things and never end up deploying through my whole time there. And you end up being spun up for things that don't happen more than you do actually deploy. Uh, so he's like, no, nah, it's just like another one. You know, we're all getting all jocked up and crazy about this one, but really we haven't got a mission yet. And those kind of things. I was like, all right, well, let me, let me know, man. Cause I mean, <laughs> Bill, it's like sucks. It sucks to be, at, you know, not in the loop like that. And, um, and I, it, it was, uh, and then they and then they left a couple of weeks after that. <laughs> um, but uh, it just got so busy so quick. I'm sure um, I ran into guys. I want to say uh, when did I? So in in what was it? Oh one, oh two, maybe. So I was kind of resolved. It's like okay, let's get back to DC. Let's get closer and get into school, and I'll keep track of what's going on and all this other stuff and uh j just i wanted to get close enough to to literally physically be close enough to go check on things and oh man i want to say it was oh oh two or oh three and they're off and running already in afghanistan and uh then all the contracting stuff starts happening and i hear i see guys coming through dc and they know i'm in dc and they're saying, hey, man, we got this contract. We're going to go do this, that, and the other thing. And uh, I was a little reluctant on doing that at first because it's one of those things. It was the one I, I was really unknown. I didn't know who I was going to be working with. And I said, well, all I want to do, I don't want to work with anybody. I just want to work with guys that I know or have some sort of similar backgrounds. And if I don't know names, then usually you know names of people. And um, in, in the community, it's small. So you, you typically know or hear about certain people. And the first one that I heard about was Triple Canopy. And it was all unit guys and dev grew. And I was like, yep, I'll do it. And uh, that's when I jumped back on the on the bandwagon and um, did, did the whole, uh, you know, th now Iraq has now started and that was so on the beginning of Iraq late 03 and 04 that's when I jumped on that bandwagon and got back into it when you're contracting for triple canopy this is before your CIA days correct yep so what is the and I'm fascinated by the entire contractor phenomenon of the GWAT but what is your what was your job as a contractor in Iraq it, in that time period yeah so uh, for triple canopy I was a, a team leader or program manager for a site so in every site you're going to have um x number of americans in the critical areas and then we're training locals to absorb all the rest of the stuff all the the we call them window lickers right the guys in the back of the vehicle ready to shoot somebody um uh site security all those kind of folks we're going to train all those folks we're going to recruit them vet them pay them train them and then put them to work on you know uh, base security or whatever um, and then some of them on protection details for their own people. And so that's what we were doing. So when I first got there, um, I wasn't on a specific site. So I'm in Baghdad and we're just waiting for, um, 
you know, things to grow and uh, coalition provisional authority is, is kind of starting to spread out. So we're waiting on those folks to do that. And while we do that, we're just, um, we're all, me and a bunch of other guys, we're running around Iraq uh, doing site surveys for places that we might end up having contracts and um, running up and down route Irish to Baghdad International Airport at the time, which was, uh, I say it's fun because I didn't get shot at and blown up like a lot of other people did. But uh, that was exciting, I guess, to say <laughs> the least, to go up and down that road during those times. I'm on. I'm unfamiliar with the road with the I. You call it the Irish Road Route Irish Route Irish. I'm completely unfamiliar yeah. with this. What is this? It is the main road between what was the Green Zone and where the uh, Presidential Palace area was um, to Baghdad International Airport. So it's it's a it's a. Um, it's a pretty big road. So it's almost, it's like an interstate wide road and it goes, and it's the main road that goes to and from the airport and the presidential palace area, which is then now the green zone. Um, but that's where um, everybody got hit on that road. Uh, Cause that's, that was the main road between your support structure in the airport where everything's landing to get to uh, the green zone. So there was only one road. And that was it. And people were getting ambushed there all the time. Um, anything from somebody on an overpass throwing grenades down on cars while they passed to uh, actual ambushes, rockets, small arms fire, machine gun fire and stuff like that. They hit everybody on that road. Um, I know the army was patrolling in that area a lot just to try to keep it somewhat tame. But that was that was. <clears throat> identified and I, I don't know where they said it um but they said it was the most dangerous road in the world at the time and uh, but what, what can you do you got to go get stuff right absolutely well i'm i'm curious now because you're talking about dropping grenades ambushes you know the military has its defined set rules of engagement there you know that are run by the military but you're a contractor. So if I'm going to throw you a situation, you tell me what the rules of engagement would be. You're driving down this road. You see some guys up on an overpass. They look like they might got AK slung under a vest or something. And they're watching you come up. Maybe they're on a cell phone. Maybe they're on a radio. Yeah. Do you got to wait for those guys to open fire on you? Or if you have reason to believe they have malicious intent, can you shoot first? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, because they're TTPs, they're, they're, they're techniques, tactics, and, and practice, right? They, that's what they did. So if we saw somebody doing that or in a position that looked like they were doing it, yeah, you can you can actually, yeah, it was a wet, wild, wild west back then. Um, uh, yeah, if you thought that's what they were doing, you could take the shot. Um, but from an armored vehicle that, I mean, oh, well, an unarmored vehicle, we're all in soft skin vehicles. And so, to try to hit something while you're moving as fast as you could. We were, we were hauling ass. Um, that would be difficult, right? So they actually got smart at that. And um, they did it if you're traveling down one side of the road and they would wait for you on the overpass on the other side where you didn't see them. Gotcha. So they'd know you're coming and then just time it to where they started throwing grenades off the, the overpass. And, um, so what we ended up doing, it was kind of, so every underpass or every overpass we went under, um, we'd start up, we'd enter on one side, right? Like on one side of the road. And then while we're on the other pass, take, you know, a left-hand turn almost and steer to the left a little bit. So if they drop something that, it, you know, it's in the next lane, but um, yeah, that's why we're down this road zigzagging. And over time, rubbled cars are on the road. So those become obstacles. And you're just zigzagging all these burnt cars and everything. Um, the army used to go down there and clear them out every once in a while. Um, they used to get hit in that area. They patrolled those neighborhoods alongside the roads. I mean, it was it was pretty bad. Um if we brought back a generator once, and that's all we we're gonna do. We're not we're not going to protect the the generator we're we're there for the people who are driving the truck which is our guys and uh they uh you know truck a truck and a trailer that one goes so fast you know so we stayed back from it because they're the the bullet magnet <laughs> and we're just going to be there in case something happens we can uh 
you know, maneuver on the, whoever was attacking them. And, um, and we made it, they drove and, uh, we made it, you know, heard some gunfire and we didn't know, you know, okay, that's it. There's no ambush. There's no big thing going on. Um, we got back to the green zone, got to our, our, where we're staying and, um, saw all kinds of bullet holes, <laughs> new bullet holes <laughs> in the generator. <laughs> and the, so they were so far apart. And we were within what we considered small arms fire. But so we heard the gunshots, but we couldn't tell, you know, if they got hit or not. And um, when they picked up speed as much as they could, that's obviously when they were getting shot at. And uh, yeah, we didn't we didn't see exactly where they were, we were coming from. There's a neighborhood that was like there's a huge, I don't know, shoulder. But until you get to the neighborhood, there's a pretty decent like 50, 50 yards, maybe of just dirt, like a shoulder uh, worth of, you know, area that they can be in the neighborhood somewhere from a building. You would never see them. They just start shooting from that building. Um, and a lot of times they were just in their homes and they say, Hey, there's somebody on the road and let's shoot at them. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of the sign of the times then you get, you know, just hit the gas and keep going. Don't stop till you get to one side or the other. I, I love your tactics of we're just going to change lanes under the, that's so simple, but so <laughs> smart. Uh, I guess that's what, you know, maybe they teach you that in the unit or something. What year then do you move on to the CIA? So 04, 05, I'm in Basra with DynCor and 06, I get to the agency. So summer of 06. And what is your role then? You've been a, a member of Delta Force. You've been a contractor in the early years of the war in Iraq. What is now your job in the CIA? So as a protective agent, and um, what we're doing is the same thing I was doing in Triple Canopy, really, for the State Department. Uh, we're, we're protecting the, uh, the intel collectors when they go to their meetings. And uh, all the all the folks, it doesn't matter. I mean, some of these folks are the actual terrorists themselves, um, but they're trying to get into their cell and and, and get information on their network, and uh, or uh, an informant within a, a neighborhood who's who's hiding people, right? Those kind of folks. Um, so yeah, that was that was uh, that's what we did. Uh, so most of the folks, so post nine eleven, it wasn't enough time. So to get all the intel collectors through the through the, the farm um, and into the field because it just took too long. So they started um, just getting them the critical information they need to do their job as an intel collector, and then we'll put a team with them to make sure they're safe. And that's that's where we came in. The, so you said 06. Were you in Iraq at all while the hunt for Zarqawi was still going on, or had he been killed by the time you were fully in the CIA? Uh, I don't know. I probably was there because between between the contracts, I had another contract where I went to Afghanistan for a bit. Um, I'm not sure exactly where I was then. Because I was in ba in Iraq, I was in Basra, um, Baghdad, uh, Bakuba, Tikrit for a bit, um, Ramadi. <laughs> I was all over the place. Gotcha. And I just curious because again, young people watching this, I say the names are Cowie. They might not have any idea who who we're even referring to. And obviously, yeah. he as a is a former Delta and CIA guy. Who would you rank as the worst terrorist that you ever? you know, I, I wouldn't say come across, but that was alive while you were at work. Was it Bin Laden? Was it Zarqawi? Who was it? Oh, Zarqawi's on the top of that list, probably, yeah. Um, but, and and uh, so in 05, uh, Muqtada al Sadr was another dude who's, not, he just started his stuff, right? And he didn't get militant right away. So during the, uh, probably 04, 05, um he's starting his stuff right he's starting to get more famous and and get his group together so uh in what was it early 06 so they're starting to wall off cyber city at the time because of it and uh late 05 i think um <clears throat> and that becomes another little war zone within baghdad um so he was the first one so he was him and his folks uh 
yeah, they were they were bad, but Zarkawi he 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 turned it up a notch, definitely. It the Zarkawi stuff, the cutting off the heads, and then obviously ISIS comes, you know, yep. years, few years after he gets killed. Um, it just it's hard for people, I think, to grasp that kind of evil. I've interviewed some people from your old team that were involved in the hunt for him and the yeah. stuff, the stories they have about the stuff they came across. I, I don't even feel comfortable repeating. Like it's so gross yeah. what this guy was doing um, on the CA. So you're a protective agent. I have a couple things because not some I'm overly familiar with, which is why I was really excited to have you. I know in your Sean Ryan interview, you talked about the coast. Am I pronouncing that right? The coast bombing. Uh-huh. And that's that's depicted in the movie Zero Dark Thirty, um, where they blow up the they suicide bomb the car. I don't know if you've seen Zero Dark Thirty. It's a good film. Yeah. Um, what went wrong to where a situation like that was able to happen? And then were there protocols that were changed to make sure it didn't ever happen again? So yes, there were protocols that changed as a result of that. But um, what went wrong? So. Uh, in my opinion, it was a uh, failure of leadership uh, at several levels. Um, uh, but he, he, I've seen it a lot, and and I hate to say it, but um, so I get there in late 09 into Kabul, and I'm in charge of the, the protective group, protective operations group that's there. And I'm getting a I'm getting a picture. So I'm in Iraq the whole time until then. I get there in 09. And um there's a lot of things that we're not doing the way, you know, we're not doing things efficiently enough and we can be more efficient in the way we're protecting these folks and protocols that we have from a security protective standpoint that we're being um I guess uh mandated from outside of our our group. So that was that was even on my list of things to do. Like, hey, we got to get this thing standardized. So, our, my guys, all the guys that were out there doing the protection work, aren't uh, having to do something different if they go from base to base. It's the same thing everywhere we go. So it was a little disjointed in that regard. Uh, but there, the each individual base officer was uh, chief was given the latitude to do that, and which totally jacked up my guys because um, you almost had to know a different a different language every time you go to another base. We're going to treat these people like this at this base and these people like this at another base. Um, but a lot of pressure, I think, was put on um, the chief out there that uh, unfortunately forced her to make decisions that that uh, weren't necessarily the right way to do things. Uh, one of the things was not not paying attention to to my guys that were on the ground um, on how to how to actually conduct the the meeting um safety protocols and all that stuff um scott that was out there uh as the the team lead for the the team that was protecting them yeah, i was on the phone with him a lot and i again i just got there early december and um getting my feet on the ground trying to figure out what's going on and uh he, he at one point said hey there's and there's been other guys too before him that were getting ready for him because over the time He's canceling meetings and all that stuff, right? I'm just getting privy to all the things that were happening along the way. And uh, the, uh, Scott shows up um, and uh, he's trying to wrap his mind around, you know, hey, this is not the way we do things, but uh, we we need to do it differently and to make sure that everybody's safe. Well, those are kind of um, not adhered to. And uh, Scott, I remember Scott calling me one time, and um, he he said, well, he, they're not going to do it the way I want to do it. And it's going it, to, you know, I can't be responsible for this because it's not, it's not going to be, it's not going to come out good. If something bad happens, it's not going to look good on him. And he's not comfortable with it. And I was like, well, you can always just refuse. And not, if, if it's that safe, then I, I don't know this dude either. <laughs> it's like, but if, if they're saying that's that safe, then you don't have to be there at all. Uh you know, he can do something else. And um, he eventually does that. And he says, well, if, if it's that safe, then I don't need to be here at all. Because they wanted to do it things differently. And um, at one point, he just said, well, it's going to happen. He's coming. And he felt bad. He was going to feel bad if he wasn't there to do something. 
And um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, they work with what they get. And unfortunately, you know, gets him and two other the Jiris dudes. And um, yeah, it doesn't work out well for us in the end. So in the movie Zero Dark Thirty, what the public sees in Zero Dark Thirty and then what actually happened, are those similar? No. I think you got the point across, but yeah, it wasn't wasn't anything like that. One, you can't see you can't see that far. Like the I think they had the chief in the movie looking at through binos out at across the desert or something like that, right? So it's not like that at all. You don't you don't see anywhere past I mean maybe 50 feet from where they were standing. But I think they got a point across. That was fine. I was you know made sense to me it's like okay it gets the point across in the movie and i guess they have to do it that way but that's fine when you had heard where were you when you had heard what had happened and do you remember kind of what your immediate emotions were oh yeah um so i was in Kabul at our headquarters building there and i kn- knew the guy that was working in what we call the uh, the office that was managing or overseeing or had pictures we call it the um the uh and it was kind of the hub it's like the communications hub we had cameras and everything for every base that was happening out there all the communication goes into this one place and i was at my office down the hallway and the guy that i another former unit guy uh, now working for the agency uh comes down the hallway and he's like hey ninja come over we, uh, come here something just happened He's grabbing everybody in this hallway. So all in that hallway is the all the uh, all the managers, all the senior leaders and managers of who's running operations in Kabul or in Afghanistan. And um, as we get to this, he get to his office and he said, I just got this is just in. I mean, so bear with the initial reporting, but there's been a bombing. It's happened. At, I, I can't remember where they said the exact spot. It's in it's in coast. Um, and I wasn't familiar with that spot on the ground. And I thought it was downtown because he said, these are the, this is what I got so far on KIA and wounded and, and all this stuff. And, uh, some of the names on the list were, uh, some of my guys. And I thought this is happening downtown somewhere. Cause that's what we do. We take people out in town to do meetings. And I wasn't privy to any of the planning for that thing. So that's where I thought it was. And, um, my initial thoughts was okay if there's only four guys on the ground they just mentioned three names so literally the whole team is gone and i got to get some more guys on the ground and um real quickly in this little huddle um so a little disjointed on what to do immediately um a little, little hesitation on stuff and i said well i'm gonna go get some guys get them ready to fly to uh coast and I'll be right back and told the, our contractor team leader to get a bunch of guys, get four guys ready to fly with me to coast. Something's happened there. I don't have any details, but we got to get there. Like right now, go pack some bags. And as he's assembling guys, I go back upstairs. <clears throat> and so we have the guy who's running the air, the air operations, who has control of all the airplanes and helicopters in the, in Afghanistan. Um, he's making his phone calls and radio calls and alerting people um, everybody's, you know, starting to jump through hoops to get out there. Um, a ground team is actually ready to, to roll, um, which is takes, that's going to be a bit if we have to do that. Um, and at the same time, we have some aircraft that are down for maintenance and they're waiting for parts. So they're, they're, the, the weather conditions weren't allowing things either visibility and all that stuff. Uh, we're hindering some things, um, but we finally get on the ground, get in a plane. Um, that plane gets a flat tire on the tarmac. <laughs> that was a mess. Um, but we finally get on the ground. And by the time we get there, so we're talking explosion plus four hours or so. Um, they're already, the last person is lifting off when we arrive and going to the nearby army base or uh, military base and to the uh, hospital. Um, so, yeah, it was... Um, you know, and I think um, if I'm correct, the actual reporting said, you know, lack of leadership, 
uh, or a failure of leadership at several levels. Um, and Leon Panetta at the time, the director, he he was a good he was a he was the first one to say you know it starts with me. Um, but be honest with you, I think could have been handled differently. Should have been handled differently, obviously. But um, the uh, I think that on the operations side, just the the chief that was out there just was, there's too much pressure on that person to make something happen sooner pressure into making some mistakes or making some decisions that otherwise probably wouldn't have been made. And so that's when I say failure of leadership, the pressure that was put on the chief at the time um, probably shouldn't have gone down that way. So first time in the field, working with all these other folks like my guys and how the dynamics of that is supposed to work or usually works. Um, you know, that was just, uh, I, I think there was just too much pressure for the chief at the time. Um, and then, and then our guys did exactly what they were supposed to do, given what the situation they were in. Um, so who who knows? I mean, the only thing that they would have did differently is they wanted to do everything. We do everything outside the base, right? So everybody's safe. By the time they get to the base, then we know we're turning over somebody who's perfectly clean. You know, no no weapons, no bombs, no nothing. Um, that's just not the way it happened, but. Um, yeah, bad things happen. Decisions are made. I mean, uh, in combat and war and those kind of situations, and sometimes, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, right? And I wish it would have been. Uh, and me and a lot of folks wish it would have went differently, but um, it wasn't. Uh, it's not that. Uh, it's not a place to say, you know, I told you this was going to happen. I told you so, kind of thing. But you know, it's it's happened in places before. And but we did change a lot of protocols, uh, so it wouldn't happen again. Put some fail safes in there at different levels, um, yeah. And uh, so far, so far, so good. I think you know things happen though. I mean, yeah. So for us, uh, we're, we're we're the people who who are putting ourselves. So that's our that's our job, right? Putting ourselves in harm's way uh, early on and far enough away so everybody else is safe if that's the case that's, that's what we're dealing with right um but we, we weren't our guys weren't allowed to do that so um and unfortunately the little um more people were injured uh just because they wanted it a little bit more um i don't know like uh almost uh like a meeting a meeting a meeting greet kind of thing like yeah. you know a more welcoming environment was kind of the thing i want a more welcoming environment and in our mind and the guys that were out there, it's like, okay, I, well, we don't know this dude. And so we're going to treat him like a bad guy, just like that, just from the start. Um, and let him prove to us that he's not before we hand him over to uh, all of our officers. Um, that's not the way it went down, but um, yeah. I, I really appreciate you sharing that and shining a light and reflecting on that because I think it's a story that is not just important, but a lot of people, maybe not as many people should know, but that does kind of lead into a segue of something that I think is very famous. And that is the attack on Benghazi in 2012. Uh, I remember where I was actually when Benghazi happened, I was younger, uh, obviously <laughs> it happened a long time ago. And I remember the claims about, you know, the videotape, they attacked it because of the, you know, that guy made that YouTube video. I think that all ended up getting debunked rather quickly, but from a pure tactical standpoint, because this is your area of expertise, what could have been done before Benghazi happened to have stopped the situation that unfolded? Mm, wow, that's a great question. Um, I, th I think more along the lines of uh, uh, of uh, I, I just want to say pre preparation. So we're talking about two different entities, though. So we're talking about Department of State and then our folks, right? Um, it, the, Department of State does what they do, right? They're they're uh, uh, politicians, and bureaucrats, and um, you know country builders, you know, they're, they're more of a, take more of a passive approach to security than we do. Um, 
And really, it's just a mindset. If this would have happened, and I think they portrayed it in the movie too, but um, our guys are telling them, hey, you guys need to step it up, step up your game on, you know, security and and stuff like that. Uh, and it's it's pretty common for that for the State Department to rely on us uh, for a lot of things like that. Um, and again, two years after that in Tripoli, same thing. Um, I, I think from a tactical standpoint, um, the, and it's happened before, uh, 93 in Mogadishu, the guys were, were not allowed to have certain things available to them. AC-130 you know, AC gunships and all that stuff. Just to say that, uh, anything like that, um, same thing in this situation. They wanted to, they didn't want it to, uh, I guess, provide that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so a more passive approach to the security. Um, but I mean, you, you, you're, you're going to get what you get and it's, un, it's, it's a, almost like an underestimation of the, the threat capability. Um, our guys are a little bit better at that because of the backgrounds, right? Coming out of the special operations community and those kind of things. Um, you know, it, it just, it, it was just, you know, literally from all the way up to, you know, the white house, just lack of uh, support, I guess, for that, for that particular site. Two, two things on that front. I, one of the big things is that the consulate had like the local security that fled, Right. As soon as shit hit the fan, they just picked their guns up and, and left and went home. Was were, were your guys, did they know that those dudes were completely untrustworthy and would be absolutely useless in an <laughs> event of a crisis, which correct me if I'm wrong, is what happened. Like the local guys did nothing to protect that consulate, right? Yeah. And I'm almost positive they had a good idea what their local guard force would do. And because, uh, yeah, it, it, I think, and then they tried to portray that in the movie too. I think when the uh, they one of the um, State Department RSOs is talking to, they're having an argument out front about uh, pay or something like that, right? Um, yeah, it's it's a it's it's a um, I guess not 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 uh, not paying attention to uh, one of the dynamics of the people that are there, right? The, the different militias and who's, who will really do what for you when it push comes to shove. Um, and we've seen it over and over again uh, that, okay, you can train a militia or a group of folks to protect you all day long, but you know, if they go home every day, so if their family or them are co coerced into so doing something, then they're easily, easily uh, influenced to do that kind of stuff. I'm going to hold your family hostage. I'm going to take your family, kill your family. If you, cause I know you work at the, for the Americans, you know, that kind of stuff happens all the time. And so yeah, to put so much, uh, to rely on so much on the, on those kind of folks. I mean, that, 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 that that should have been learned a long time ago, but that's a really common error in a lot of places that we go or well, that I've been over the years. Um, yeah. And, and, and for me, it's like, uh, and a lot of guys, it's like, you don't, you don't, we don't put out that much trust in the locals, uh, the local militias, whoever they are. Um, if it's not an American, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask for your support, but I'm, I'm going to go ask for Americans as well. Um, and guess who shows up other Americans usually. Right. Yeah, local guard forces, they're not usually the, you know, security guards at best. Um, and so if you hit them, you know, if you pressure them that hard, if they start getting shot at, <laughs> they're going to do exactly what they did then uh, and run, right? It, it's, uh, yeah, it's just not good. Was it, was it um, Glenn Doherty or Tyrone Woods that came in? from Tripoli because one of them came in from Tripoli. One of the two of your guys, the CIA guys who died, they were in Tripoli and had to come in on a flight. Correct. Yep. yep. And this is what I'm curious. So was that, was that Tyrone Woods or Glenn Doherty? Glenn Doherty. He was on so, the Tripoli team. Okay. So Glenn Doherty comes in from Tripoli and it's portrayed in the movies and some books that there's a huge holdup about whether or not help 
is going to be sent. How realistic is that? Was there debate about could they send people from Tripoli and things of that nature? I'm not sure what communication between Tripoli and Benghazi there was um, on who's coming, when they're coming, and who's on the ground and where they're at. I'm not sure what that communication was. Um, but there, it's also it's also just another small team, right? And guess guess what? They're going to do what they the best they can with what they got, but it's it's again it's the other available assets in the Mediterranean that that were not alerted to to respond is the biggest thing because ultimately, I mean, yeah, the small force can add some more uh, another level of percent higher percentage of survivability of whatever's coming, but um, who knows how that's how long it's going to last? And I don't even know how that decision came and went uh, all the way up to national command authority at the time. But um, yeah, uh, ultimately nobody showed up outside of what was there. It, and uh, absolutely correct. And so is that the same plane that he arrives on that brought the two Delta operators? Were they all in the same group? Yes. Yeah. They were all from Tripoli. And, and I think most people in the public don't even know that there were two Delta guys that came because it's not, it hadn't been covered it's not in the movie it's there's one sentence in the entire movie that references it but yeah. it, it is kind of interesting that here you are uh C your cia guys are there and then your old unit two of those guys um are also there it's just i don't know if i'd say a small world but in a situation like that you've got cia guys you now who have come you've got two delta commandos who are also in this this response team when they're on the rooftops and bullets are flying, who's given orders in that situation? Is it the CIA team? Is it the Delta guys? When it's a gunfight, who's dictating what's going to happen? Yeah, it, it would have stayed with uh, the big Gazi team, the, the agency guys. Gotcha. You know, one of those two Delta guys was actually a former Marine. He had, he yeah. was one of the rare, one of the crossovers because that doesn't happen a, a ton, yeah. but uh. Uh, I won't say his, it's Ben. I won't say his name. There's no point doing it. But I've always thought that those two guys. I wish more people knew that there was that they'd gone, but nobody, nobody really does. Um, I just have a couple more questions for you. This has been an absolutely fascinating interview. These are kind of the fun ones we like to uh, we like to end with. As everyone watching the show knows, I ask every tier one guy the exact same question. It is the SEAL Team Six versus Delta Force. Uh, in your opinion, you. Some guys take this question super seriously. Some guys have fun with it. There's no right or wrong answer. Don't worry about offending anyone. Delta. Between, yeah. <laughs> why can you explain why Delta is a superior direct superior unit than SEAL Team Six, in your opinion? So, so in my opinion, the uh so the it's the it's the uh experience before you get there, right? So guys are already coming out of Ranger Battalions, SF community, the infantry guys, they know already another, uh, they're already at another level before they even try out. Um, not not so much with uh, the SEAL teams and um, and uh, and our, our counterparts in the Navy. They're, they don't have that same like base knowledge. They're at a different level when they go start, right? And I guarantee if you talk to one of those guys, they say the same thing. They do. Yeah. Uh, it, we just have, uh, and it's a different also leadership kind of structure of things too, a uh, different atmosphere. Um, so yeah, I army, go army. The and and one of the things every Delta guy, uh, well, number one, I've never I've asked that question to a handful of people. I mean, a bunch of people. Only one person's ever been super offended, and it was actually a Navy SEAL. And it wasn't even a SEAL Team 6 guy. It was just a regular Navy SEAL, and he got super pissed. But one of the Delta, a lot of Delta guys say that you guys, your CQB is faster and better than theirs is, that you guys just do it better, you flood better. Is it just because you guys get better training? Is it because you have more time doing it? Like, why is Delta CQB, and across the board, they all say it's better. Why is that? Well, I think that part of it is the the level that you go into it with, right? So you start, you got a different base level when you when you get there. So, and then you just keep refining that. And 
it, it is again, it's again, it's a different, um, it's like a different uh, mindset uh, towards doing that kind of stuff, right? Um, so there's, when I say combat arms, so there's no, in the Navy, uh, there's no, they don't start out with like, like infantry SF, like combat, uh, oriented, um, cause they don't have, they don't even have MOSs like that or military op operational specialties, right? Their, their jobs aren't, uh, combat oriented. You know, they could be any number of things. I don't even know what the MOSs that are in the Navy are, but they're not, running and gunning with guns and and camouflage in your face and all that kind of stuff i mean that's the basic stuff you, you we're talking about um so it starts at a whole nother level and then it just goes it gets better from there I, i'm gonna kind of phrase this into a, the next thing and, and this is a bit more of a serious in-depth question on a similar topic you see a lot of um a lot of bad negative pr news stories that come out about the seals that you know whether it's drugs the entire groups getting fired whatever it might be you don't really see like there's not a flood of delta stories negative headlines granted there's been issues they're human there's going to be issues is that is that a maturity thing why do you not hear about the same issues you do hear from the navy seals you don't hear anything like that coming out of delta um, yeah, I think, um, uh, so it's, it's different with, uh, with dev crew too, though, cause they're a little less, uh, cause it, most of it you hear are from the rest of the other SEAL teams. Right. Right. Um, so dev is a little bit better, a lot better than it, than the other teams. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a different mindset really. I mean, you're, we're, we're coming from a totally different place to begin with um and again that's that really i think sets the stage for all that stuff gotcha i i am curious now uh if you're in delta obviously you talk about how an ot i'm gonna hear it from all my guys that i know that we're in dev too <laughs> well well trust me your answer uh that your answer has been very diplomatic kind of just sticking to the your, your points <laughs> i've i've had some delta guys go in on that question getting hyper specific um i'll tell when i when i stop when i'm done when we turn off the recording i'll tell you the best answer i ever got i i can't repeat it and post it on the internet but uh if you're a delta you said mistakes are not tolerated uh in otc really once you're on a squadron i've heard guys say it's the hardest job in the world to get and it's the easiest to lose what are some examples of things that are guaranteed to get you fired from delta force if you do them um i just it's all based on your decisions right um because in otc it's like hey that was that was one next time you're gone right in uh, squadron um wow. it might take on a more personal thing right like okay hey man you're not you're not here today you're something going on you need to go take care of it and get back here when you're when you're head straight um so there's that but there's also i mean if it's a um if it's a serious thing in town or a, uh, like a DUI or something like that, and you get into trouble that way, there's, there's no tolerance for that. It's like, you got to try to, uh, you know, that's like, okay, you're going to have to sit on the bench and then where do you, where else do you want to work kind of thing? Um, over the years though, I mean, it's, it's, it's still, it, we know you're going through something kind of thing. So it's more of a conversation if, cause you know, everybody and what they're going through and, um, so it's, it's dealt with, it's not just like you're a problem child go, if you're having an issue and it can be, you know, you need help, then, then they're going to do that. But, um, that's when you get into squad and you're already rolling there for a while. Is, is there more tolerance for mistakes that are performance based over, um, like if you just turn out to be a shitty human and you just turn out to be, you know, a bad person for lack of a better term. Yep. are they just going to cut ties and say, see you later as to where, like, if you're, maybe you've been injured, you're not as quick uh, in CQB, maybe they still phase you out, but it's dealt with in a much politer, softer way. Yeah. Uh, kind of. It's, um, I mean, it really, it's, it's really, you have to be ready. Right. And if you're not ready, then all right, it's not a big deal. You're just not ready you know, going to have to go somewhere else. Um, if it's a disciplinary thing, that's a whole nother thing. Um, 
yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it, there's no favoritism. I mean, it literally is a readiness thing. If I'm not ready and I know it, I'm going to tell them, Hey, I'm not ready to go on this mission or whatever it is. Right. And they're like, Hey, Roger that. Thanks for saying, thanks for saying that. Right. Um, cause there was a time that I had to do that, but, um, you know, there, so I've heard that I've heard this other, uh, like analogy, like, um, like every day you show up for work and you might not, your badge might not work. Right. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't work like that quite, quite like that. But, um, I never felt that kind of a pressure that I might not leave. I might have to go somewhere else today, but it is a performance thing. You're, you're, you're expected to perform at a hundred percent when you show up. Um, the whole time you're there and if you're not yeah it's the you'll your teammates will come down on you and so it starts there your teammates will get in on your get in and make sure you're you're straight but they'll also know if you're dealing with things um so it's either right away because hey we told you once we're not going to tell you again and you did it again all right you're gone um so there's there's uh yeah some leeway but there's expected performance you know all the time it's like you know they're not gonna uh it, but they'll help you <laughs> it's like where do you want to work because you're not working here anymore right they'll help you find another job <laughs> and uh it won't be a disciplinary kind of thing you'll just be uh you know shit happens I've got two questions left for you. And uh, the last one is one that uh, someone suggested, but the second to last one is, and I love hearing different answers to this in the movies. There's always this like red phone. And right before the world is going to end, the red phone goes off. And it's like, if we don't find someone in 10 minutes, you know, something terrible is going to happen. Is that the stuff like that actually exists? Like there's a phone. And if you pick that phone up, Someone is going to be on the other end of that. And we have five, 10, 15 minutes, two hours, whatever it might be. We got to go right now or something really bad is going to happen. Or is that just Hollywood fiction? Mm. So there is, um, yes, that, that that is somewhat true. So we were always held at, a, uh, I think it was 18 hours, be anywhere in the world in 18 hours. That's from coming from your homes, wherever you're at, to get your stuff on, get to the airfield and go. So to a certain extent, yes. Uh, mostly, though, you'll know it's coming. Got it. I was, this is a little bit of both. There you go. That's for the last one. Um, I recently interviewed a former member of the SAS, uh, Lindsey Bruce, in, in first ever SAS guy I interviewed. And people were like, you got to get a Delta operator's opinion on the SAS because he, the SAS guy, had a ton of things to say about the unit because they'd cross-trained. He deployed mm -hmm. to Iraq with them. What is your opinion as a former Delta Force member of the SAS in England? Yep, they're good. Yeah, they're good. Um, and they have, they have a, a uh, they they used to be more oriented towards their domestic responsibilities because they can actually operate in in uh, England as well. So they're actually, uh, so back to the um, uh, Princess Gate thing back in the day, right? Uh, they can do that. We can't because we're uh, army and uh, post comitatus and all that stuff. We can't operate within the United States. But um, since the GY and that's all the time they spent in the war zones, um, they're a little bit more uh, combat oriented. And um, I think that their counterparts over in Australia the same way. They're good though. They're good at what they do. There you go. You heard it right from uh, right from Bob. Well, Bob, hang back. I'm going to kill this recording here in a second because I want to tell you that that SEAL Team Six Delta story. I was told, um, but Bob, <laughs> I really appreciate it. Could you tell people real quick if they're interested in learning more of your stories, where they can follow you, maybe on social media? Yeah, uh, Shinobi Bob on Instagram, ninjabobsolutions.com for the website. And from that website, you can go to any of the other social media stuff. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for Bob and uh, Bob joining me today. And we'll, we'll call it a day right there. Yeah, thanks for having me.